Welcome, Sahadia. We're so excited that you were able to join us today. Why don't you start off just talking a little bit about your interest in aerospace engineering, how you got involved, and a little bit about who you are. Sure. Thank you, Shauna and Kevin, for having me on today. Um, I got interested in aerospace engineering when actually I saw the Magic School Bus. Um, when I saw that show, it, it just kind of introduced me to space science, you know, the constellations and things like that. And also even the vehicle itself, the Magic School Bus, just really motivated me to learn more about space and even engineering or designing vehicles to take us to places we've never been before. Um, and just after that, just pursuing the undergrad at the University of Florida in aerospace engineering and getting involved in clubs like the Small Satellite Design Club and just doing projects to inspire people from the local community to pursue science just really opened up my eyes and you know motivates me to pursue my PhD in aerospace engineering. I'm going to ask you just to check your volume just a skosh, see if you can bump it up just a little bit while I'm thinking about that. And uh, so maybe to a listener who's not sure exactly what aerospace engineering as a field covers, can you kind of give us a little bit of a, an idea of what that would look like? Yeah, sure. You mean like what are some of the projects or... You yeah, like what, what's the... When someone's thinking about becoming an aerospace engineer, what are they imagining doing with their, their careers later? Yeah, an idea of the breadth of the type of work that an aero engineer is involved with. Okay, so I would say um, from my background, one is if you're designing a vehicle that's going to travel through the air... Um, you want to understand the properties of the flow around it in order to design, you know, for, for example, what material should be on the vehicle. So if you're designing something like a spacecraft that's going to do some mission on this planet or another planet, um, there's concepts of aerospace engineering. You need to do that. Um, also, I would say it's very interdisciplinary. Um, if you think about like CubeSat, you know, you need to understand, you need people that do electrical engineering, computer engineering. So it's very, it allows you to kind of experiment in different fields at the same time, which I think is one of the positive things, which I like about it. Um, Cause some of the projects that I've worked on, the aerospace engineering classes, for example, deal with how the fluid flows around the aircraft. Um, but you also need to understand chemistry. You need to understand physics. Um, so I would say it's very, it's becoming an inter interdisciplinary field. Um, but usually when you think about aerospace engineering, you think about Boeing or Lockheed, you think about commercial aircraft or spacecraft. Awesome. Um, I want to back up just a minute. You attended UF as an undergrad and for your master's, both aerospace engineering. Now, did you go to high school in Florida or did you just see UF out there and you were somewhere else and you said, I want to go to that school. How, how did you end up at UF? Oh, okay. So I did my high school in a small town in Okoe in Florida, actually. Um, and after that, um, I actually missed the deadline for UF. And I ended up going to Valencia Community College for two years, actually. And, and when I went there, I just did my general, like, my general classes like calculus and physics. And I did that for two years. And while at Valencia, they didn't have much of a aerospace engineering things going on there because it's a community college. I was just involved in the chess club there. I was president of the chess club. Um, but after that, I transferred directly to UF. Um, UF and Valencia have a great transfer program. Okay. Um, so I just transferred in as a junior in the aerospace engineering department at UF. So that's actually good advice for kids who maybe have a real passion for engineering, but may not have the resources mm -hmm. to go directly to a, a big D1, you know, top tier engineering school. Yeah, that's what I found when I was at Valencia. They, they gave me a lot of scholarship money when I was there. And when I got to UF, um, kind of comparing myself to the other students in terms of calculus and physics, I felt I was right there. Um, okay. you know, equal. The only thing was some of them were involved in some organizations on campus already, um, which was maybe the, the only drawback I saw. But 
I still got involved in a small satellite design club at UF. So if you're determined, you can make it work. Right. And for our listeners that may or may not know this, um, University of Florida, uh, early on in this CubeSat world, they launched SmompSat1. And the small satellite design club was really, um, I thought it was the way I understood it. It was the place where all of you uh, aspiring engineers went to do some really good hands-on work and build this real spacecraft, right? And uh, could you tell us just a little bit about your experience with the small satellite design club? Yeah, sure. So when I got to UF, um, I was just walking around one day and the former president was handing out flyers for a meeting. Um, and I just, I just attended the meeting and there um, the president at the time was Sheldon Clark and he was describing some of the design teams and some of the outreach work that they do with the local communities and attending the meeting. I also saw students from some of my classes. Um, and so I, I just attended a couple meetings and, and shortly after that, the following year, I, I ran for president. Um, and it was just a really cool experience. And when I was there, some of the things we did was um, we did outreach to local communities to encourage them about space science, about pursuing aerospace engineering. Um, for the homecoming parade at UF, we built a space shuttle themed float, which I thought was one of the coolest things. Um, mm -hmm. And Dante, Dante was involved in that. And we had some of... Um, students from the girls place a local organization come out and march with us in the parade um so so those are some of the things we did and i'm just glad that i got involved with the small satellite design club at uf and and, and for our listeners i want to share with you i looked at dr norm fitzcoy and the small satellite design club at uf and his senior capstone class where you worked with the um, tethered balloons and the CubeSat emulators. And I literally modeled a program for middle school students based on what I saw at UF. And we had, you know, we did have some good success. So I wanna, you know, folks like you and Sheldon and Dante were really nice. And you, when you say outreach, I was the beneficiary. Our students were the beneficiaries of the outreach you did. And not only, did our kids enjoy that? But we actually have incorporated outreach as a really strong component, even with our middle school kids. So thank you for that. You did not know that, but uh, thank That's you. That's awesome. That's awesome to hear. Karen. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking glad. about the University of Florida and its location there in Gainesville. And I grew up outside of Gainesville in the thriving metropolis of Newberry. So I'm thinking about your outreach and I'm wondering, because I'm thinking back to the people I went to middle school with and they just did not seem like the kind who were going to be getting involved in CubeSats, if you know what I mean. So how are you able to, uh, did you see a lot of interest from the, the local area, the surrounding high schools? Is it a high schools that you were reaching out to at the time where you at, or, or how did you determine what you were going to do to reach out to kind of talk to them a little bit about uh, space science? Oh, okay. Um, I think like one of the outreach events was done by the local Gainesville community. It's called Starry Night. Um, mm. And it's where people come out and I don't know, maybe Kevin, you've attended before, but there's like telescopes set up People That's can look cool. at the stars. Um, also, organizations are out there, and Small Satellite Design Club, we were out there. Um, and we brought different things out there, like our gyro chair to help people understand how, you know, attitude works. Um, so we were out there, and we had a strong presence, and that was a kind of a big kind of recruiting thing for us. Um, that was one of the things we did. And then the other thing we did was like a night in space. Uh, this was just a one-day event that we did where – some of the our officers talked about what inspires them about space and then we had someone from industry come in bob atkins who did a lot of work with lockheed martin space systems um so that's something we did and then i i think there was other high schools in the area but i think the publicity director at that time reached out but i kind of know shauna what you're saying sometimes the interest is not that strong in some areas but we kept trying though we kept trying. And no, you should, right? Because that's an underrepresented population. Rural communities, right? We know that underrepresented, we don't see a lot of, of rural uh, citizens going into the STEM fields, but we, whatever we can do to change that, it's super important. So I, I think it's great that you guys were involved in something like that. That's great. Um, so you, uh, you received, you earned your master's in aerospace engineering. Tell us what happened after that. 
so after I earned it, um, I then was trying to figure out what I'm going to do after that, right? So I was like, you know, should I be applying for jobs? But I just, I like studying. I like studying aerospace engineering. And I applied first to the Fulbright. I applied to the Fulbright. Um, and unfortunately, I was, I didn't get it. I wasn't accepted for the Fulbright. And I accept, I applied for another program called the Belgium American Education Foundation Fellowship. And it gives, it's the program between um, the United States and Belgium. And it's, they give fellowships where you can study for one year in the, um, in Belgium. And, and before I get there, while I was at UF, right before I graduated, I studied abroad for five months at the von Karman Institute for Fluid Dynamics in Belgium. Um, and this is kind of where I interacted with Kevin because um, when I got accepted for that program, they didn't at the time, the US was not funding the von Karman Institute and I didn't have any fellowships. So Kevin was working at NSF, I believe at the time, and he had some contacts um, at NSF. And I went to work at the von Karman Institute on a program called the QB50 program, which was, it was launched in 2017, but they were building double and triple CubeSats to study the lower thermosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so I got accepted at the von Karman Institute to work for the QB50 CubeSat program. So I needed funding and I reached out to Kevin and Kevin directed me to Dr. Moreto at NSF who had people working on the QB50 program. So she was able to give me a full scholarship for those five months um, because of that connection. So Kevin, thank you for making that opportunity <laughs> happen well, for me. You know, uh, two things. One, you're sharing a theme of resiliency. You know, I applied for this. I didn't get yeah. this. And, but you are uh, showing our listener, our listeners, especially our students, uh, be persistent, yeah. right? Keep, keep scratching. If you want it, go get it. Um, uh, secondly, um, I, I appreciate uh, the fact that you are always looking to expand what you're trying to learn and whatnot. But uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the theme of resiliency I'm hearing. Well, this is something that we try to instill in the kids that we work with, you know, the idea that it's okay, so it didn't work out the first time. You find another route. You don't have to stop going down that path, right? And I right. agree wholeheartedly with Shauna, but would you also say, uh, Sahadio, that while space might be almost infinite, the number of people in aerospace sometimes is quite small and it's a, it's a small sort of family. And if you, it, it really is about networks and who you know and connections. Could you speak to that? Yeah, definitely, Kevin. Um, I remember I was taking this economics course at Valencia Community College and, um, and the professor there was saying, you know, sometimes if you want to do something where a small number of people work in it, if you're passionate, enough about it and you're good and you're good at it you're going to be selected you might have to work harder um and yeah kevin you're right sometimes some of these projects um a small amount of people are chosen but i just realized as you as you network like i net i network i network with you right and um and this door opened up for me where i had a full scholarship to go at the von Karman institute and even expand my network even more um so i think resilience is is important. Um, and the last quick thing I'll say is when I came to the University of Florida, I wanted to get involved in research, but I was coming from Valencia, so I didn't really have anything apart from my cor coursework. So I just remembered I would write a letter to this professor um, who was studying space propulsion. I thought space propulsion was pretty interesting. And I wrote a note, like I handwritten the note and slipped it under his door. And, um, and I remember he never got back to me. And then like in another one week, like I knocked on his door um, and he didn't, he didn't answer. Some of these professors, sometimes they're in their office and they're working on big grants. They don't answer. It was the third time, the following week, I was like, I have to try again. And he finally opened his door and he read my letter. Then he's like, it'd be great to have you come into the lab to do research. Um, so that really helped me out because when I applied for the Von Karman inter um, internship, I had that I was working in this professor's lab in space propulsion. So I think resilience is an important point. 
man, that, that is incredible as far as like the tenacity. And, and I think it's important for, for everybody. People kind of get like a minute somebody doesn't respond back to you. You assume, oh, okay, they're not interested. You've got to keep at it. It's, it's sometimes people are just wrapped up in their own. It's not that they're ignoring you. They're just busy with their own things. So I think that's an important lesson. I want to pivot a little bit to where you are now and the work that you're doing with heat shields. Can you tell us a little bit as you're in your, your PhD program or you, you already have your PhD, your work is in heat shields, correct? Yeah, so I'm working towards my PhD, um, right. and the work I'm doing right now is um, it's just modeling the flow over the spacecraft. So sometimes when we see CubeSats or things like that, um, I would I just want to say it's okay if you directly don't want to build CubeSats. You can you can work on modeling the flow around CubeSats, you know, so which is kind of the lot of a lot of the work that I did. Um, for example, what's the lift or the drag or the force on the spacecraft due to the flow around it? So the work that I'm doing right now is when spacecraft re-enter, it gets very hot at the surface. Um, and you need materials that can with withstand um, the heat load at the surface. So a big effort at NASA is, is just improving the modeling capabilities, um, putting in more physics into the modeling to just increase the reliability of our models and can we better predict when these materials fail. So right now I'm working under Professor Schwarzenstruber at the University of Minnesota. Um, and he has a couple of grants from NASA and the Air Force to help to just model the flow, high speed flow actually, I would say hypersonics, model the flow around the spacecraft um, and to help improve the reliability of thermal protection systems, which are used on the surface of spacecraft. That, that, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, for those that really want to go one little step deeper, in your modeling, is there a lot of difference if you're looking at a particular material or a structure and you're comparing it as it enters, say, Earth's atmosphere or traveling through layers of Earth's atmosphere versus Mars or, say, Venus? Because in my mind, those are like three very different atmosphere profiles uh, does the modeling you do allow itself to be uh, translated to different planets or is it very specific? Are, are you like, I only work in the thermosphere of Earth or I'm interested in Mars? What, what, which sort of realm do you like to operate in? Oh, okay, okay. That's a good, that's a good question, Kevin. Um, so for example, like if you look at um, Pika. Pika is a material that's typically used on some of these spacecraft, and the same material was used for like a Mars entry. So I would say from a computational standpoint, the process is very similar. You just need to know the trajectory that the spacecraft is going to re-enter at. Um, for looking at something like a Mars sample return, which is in the future, um, so that's gonna be very high velocities um, so I think, I think the main thing is due to very, very high velocities, the material is going to have to change slightly. But um, the thing that I'm doing right now, you can apply it to different, to different atmospheres. The only thing that changes is the composition of the atmosphere. So, so you, need, you need some chemistry and physics model to just model the atmosphere, I would say, is the main thing. But the whole approach is very similar. Okay. When you talk about modeling the flow around CubeSats and the idea that students don't have to actually build them, they could actually just practice this, this the modeling the flow around it. Uh, is that something that could be brought down, in your opinion, to say a high school or even a middle school level? And would that be done in a, in a math class? I mean, how is that? Is, is that something our, some of our teachers could be looking into doing? Oh, okay. Um, I would say like when I, so one of the internships I did out at NASA Goddard, actually, um, there's a nice software I think I, it's called STK. Oh yeah, um, they do use STK. Yeah. So STK, I, I used that to, at the time, just to quickly describe the idea, my advisor there wanted to look at this idea of a spherical spacecraft. So spherical in nature, small. And the idea was if it, if we imagine it's spinning, it's spinning, um, what happens is a lift is created. It's just like when you, when you throw a baseball mm -hmm. and you curve it, um, just by its spinning, it changes the aerodynamic performance. So he wanted me to look at if you had a, just a spherical satellite and it's spinning, can we somehow use that as an orbital maneuver 
to extend its life in Leo. Um, so I use STK actually, which I thought was, I thought, I think high school students like will be able to use this software with, with some type of introduction. But I thought that was a really good way just to, just to model kind of the um, orbital lifetime of a satellite. And they have more sophisticated models now. I haven't used it in a while, but I would say that would be a great software. Sounds like a really good science fair project idea to do something with, with that kind of model. Yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, really Sahayo, there, there is a uh, competition that the Air Force Association sponsors called Stellar Explorers. And the entire high school competition involves that teams use STK satellite toolkit to optimize. They're really what I call optimization problems. You know, you have to count the sharks in the Great Barrier Reef. You have a satellite at a certain inclination and, and a certain orbit shape. And how do you, you know, choose the camera, choose the radios, things like that. Very, very good, uh, very good program. That's awesome. Something I wish I did was I learned STK earlier. Like some of these software, I just wish I had an introduction. It would have gave me, you know, I'd be able to do more. Right. I just saw it earlier. Now, if, if life proceeds as you anticipate, when will you receive your doctorate? And what do you think will be a great first job as either a postdoc or either in the, the world out there once you're finally done being a student? Yeah, Kevin, I would say um, hopefully I plan to finish in another year and a half. Um, and I would say I think I want to go into academia or be a professor. Um, I just attended this, this event called MIT Rising Stars in Aerospace. And the whole thing of that was kind of telling us about academia and what it takes to apply to be a professor. It was a pretty cool event. Um, and I think just, and I realized being a professor, you, you develop other people um, and you work with a community of people to, to push science. Um, kind of what you guys are doing right now. Um, and I think it's, it's a pretty cool idea to be a professor. And you're right, Kevin, before that, I would have to do a postdoc. I'm not sure in what area, but definitely and hopefully at another u university that's, that would allow me to even extend my skills and network even more. But um, I think hopefully academia, I want to end up in, in the future. Okay. Now, typically grad students, they're you know, they're sometimes characterized as almost slave labor, enormous hours, uh, thankless work, but, you know, you're paying your dues. Approximately how many, for our kids that say, I am going to be a grad student one day, right at this point in your uh, degree program, how many hours a week are typical for you? So usually what's required when you sign the uh each semester, we have to sign the graduate assistant form. It's like, if you're a full-time student, you have to spend 20 hours toward research and the other 20 hours toward your classes. Um, but the way, the way I do it right now is, um, so I think Kevin, you asked how much time I kind of dedicate toward research. Is that what you asked to clarify? Uh, and your studies, just in oh. your, your, your academic life right now. Okay, so the good thing is I just passed my oral preliminary exam about last month. Um, and that, which means I'm done with my courses. So when you start the PhD, I would say the first two years are usually kind of the hardest because you have to finish the courses and then you have the research on the side. But I finished my courses, so I'm just 100% focused on research. So, and I would say you want to spend, at, I would say minimum 20 hours a week, but it really depends because I realize with research, the more you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. You know, you want to go present at conferences and to present at these conferences, you need results of things people haven't done before. So if you want to go to more conferences and network with more people, you know, you have to put in time with the research. Um, but I also just want to say that it's worth it, you know, to go to the conferences. Like I went to the interplanetary probe workshop. I don't know if you guys heard of IPPW. No. Okay, it's a great it's a great workshop and people that design these missions to uh, to other planets, like the scientists, are at these workshops. Like so, the people that work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, 
is at these workshops. And I was able to go out there and um, I don't know if it was last year or the year before, it was hosted at Oxford actually. Um, and I had a poster of the research I'm doing at Minnesota. And it was just pretty cool to go all the way out there uh, because you have presentations more on the science side of the missions. Um, also there's engineering and there's physics. Um, so it was just, it's worth it to travel. It, it's Can you worth tell it the travel. name of that group again, IPT, that was Interplanetary? Interplanetary Probe Workshop. Um, and after this, I'll email, I'll email you guys the link, but it's a, awesome. it's a great, awesome workshop. So we actually working. have some of our students presenting at some of these posters that you're talking about, the posters, and we go to the conferences and present out too. After COVID, we kind of had to pivot a little. And so Kevin has always had students who presented at IAC, but we kind of started applying to all these other ones too. And so trying to get these little kids to understand that the level, there's, it's not just like, hey, I have an idea. I want to write you a little paragraph, but it's, it's really involved work, even posters in general. You know, as I, I look at some of the products that they come up with, I'm really impressed with the amount of research that can go on a visual, for example. Right. You know? I'm, glad, I'm glad that you're teaching them how to make posters and stuff. I wish I learned how to do that sooner. Right. That's an important skill, right? Public speaking, uh, making a great visual. We enjoy small sat. You know, we've gone to small sat for years and the kids enter the university poster competition. Um, uh, as she mentioned, the International Astronautical Congress, uh, International Space Development Conference. Um, Coast Bar. Coast Bar. We, we, I mean, we... <laughs> We, we're slinging papers wherever we can. We had actually six papers that were in Glex in Russia this month. And we have, uh, I, I think we've had 20 papers total in three years accepted at the IACs. And that's, so, a, that's amazing. Um, but that was one of the suggestions I was going to say, but you guys are way on top of that. Like, yeah. well, I think it's good for me to hear from somebody who's where you are so that, you know, we can kind of explain to these, these kids who sometimes think that this is the norm, that no, this isn't the norm. And the fact that you're learning now is going to pay off for you in so many larger ways. So I like the idea of looking into maybe showing them some modeling stuff too, mm -hmm. as part of what we're doing. Um, so as our final question, we always kind of ask in general, if you have some advice for those, um, for our listeners, like let's say that they are those kids who are about to enter the university or are thinking about a career in this field. What advice do you have for, for these kids who are just kind of heading out? Okay. So just kind of, they're entering as a freshman at the university. Yeah. Or, or yeah, or even wherever, whatever you want to say, whatever is your advice for, for students overall. I would say, um, I know a lot of people say this, but don't be afraid to just get involved. Um, you know, the topic might not seem that interesting, um, but just check it out. You have nothing to lose. And when you apply for jobs later on, you're going to need to stand out. You're going to need to be different. And when you go to these career showcases, like I went at UF, I was never successful in the beginning because I wasn't getting involved. And you know, they don't want to know the classes you took. They want to know, did you work with a team of people to accomplish a goal? Like, what did you do? What was your part? How did you contribute? You know? Yeah. So, so I would say the main thing is to just get, get involved and, um, and try new things. For example, I, I thought I wanted to do material science. I went to volunteer in a lab at UF for a semester. And then after I realized I didn't want to do it. So it's okay. You, you can, you might realize you don't want to do something. Um, and I would say also, if you can, um, study abroad, if you can later on, like toward my senior year at UF, I studied abroad for four months, but it was, it was a great experience because you kind of learn different perspectives, how to approach problems. Um, and just being with a diverse set of students, like from Italy or Spain, you'll see sometimes these kids are also smart, but they approach problems differently. Um, so I would say those are the main things and just keep networking um, and don't give up, you know, just because you're rejected from somewhere, it's fine. You just got to keep going at it. Thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you sending a lot of nuggets for us to uh, unpack after in our, in what we kind of call our outro afterwards where we take the takeaway. So I've written a lot of notes down. So thank you so much for inspiring our listeners today. I, I also want to say thank you. And uh, you know, even though we haven't talked in years, I am very proud of the work that you've done. And I agree with my colleague here. You, you said some very important things, not just for kids going to college, 
but for kids going into high school at any age. You want adults. And adults and if just... they have a passion, you, you have laid out a good roadmap for them. So we, we, we want to thank you for your time today. Thanks, Kevin and Shauna. It was great. And I'm so you know, thankful to do my, it was my first podcast actually. And I really enjoyed well, it. Well, stand by because in a few months we may invite you back again. You know, we, we need to periodically get updates. You should talk and, to your kids. Uh, yeah. I, I've already made notes. You, you're basically, <laughs> I'm conscripting you to speak to my team, my satellite team. And I, I have like five ideas that we'll talk about yeah. offline, but thanks again. And uh, we wish you the very best and we really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. So I'll be in touch. It's great meeting you guys.